people know that. He's also, <laughs> along with Amon and Max, both have won internships from the Society for Physics students. What I didn't know until just a little, uh, just an hour ago, is there were only 10 winners in the entire country. And you're, the likelihood that Sonoma State would even get one winner is small. The fact that two people from Sonoma State in the entire country won those awards is really outstanding. So I think both of mine and Max is our hand. A lot of people know Max, and he got, he, he's had classes with many of the professors who know him much better than me about his classroom work. I don't do classroom work anymore. I just work with students. I'm retired now, and I'm volunteering here, and I just work with students on projects. And that's what I really like to do. I don't really like, I'm not a very good classroom teacher, to be honest about it. I like working with individual students on projects. Max has been working with me for a, a very long time. The project he's going to talk a little bit about is actually four projects in one. I mean, any one of these could have been a complete project. He's been working for over, I don't know, is it two years now? Or two years. Close to two years. And it includes all kinds of things like software, hardware, designing boards, making boards, soldering boards. There's no part of this that he hasn't done. Okay. Now, all of the students that are working on the CubeSat team, of which we have some former ones here, we have some you've heard from today, um, Anna and Amon and Max, for example. And we got new ones in the back here who are going to uh, continue that effort. Um, I think Max's project was really quite a hard project, and he did all parts of it. What I like about student projects is but these things that he's done, and also the work that Amon's done, I hope these will be on orbit within one year, and students will be operating the satellite from the roof of the <coughs> student center, because you'll hear more about that next year. <laughs> um, and so these projects are, are team efforts, but also individual students work really hard on their own part of it. So just, so Max can explain it better than me. I'll just make one last comment. Both of Mons and Max's systems are right here sitting on the table, actually running right now. They've actually never run this long at once. It's the first time, actually. Because usually we try to get these things running, they don't last very long. Of course, you can't put them on orbit if you don't run for months. So it's interesting, I shouldn't say it out loud, because it's probably bad luck, but these have been running for, for almost a half a day now, without failure, and um, I don't think that either one of them can explain these in their short talks. So please come up and look at it and ask them questions. I hope a mom will stay and answer questions. So I'll turn it over to Max. He can explain what he did. Okay. As Garrett said, there are kind of, I'd say, two really main parts of this project. So uh, the entire goal is to be able to point the satellite by using torque coils that we're going to put in. We have to design, put into the satellite. We have to have coding to control them, turn them on and off. And then we're going to measure where the satellite's looking in space, and then we're going to try to orient it from there to a point where we actually want to be viewing uh, astronomical objects. So in 2013, uh, several students did a lot of work and launched T Logo Q. So this satellite went into space, uh, data packets were received, it executed commands from the ground station, but it had a, um, it had a torque coil on it that was never used. They were afraid of an electrical failure or something. So they never used it. So in the next satellite, it's going to be called, I think, the spin cube. There might be a name change. It was the TRL-6, which is how it's referenced in my presentation. But it's going to be the spin cube, I think, because the entire point of this next satellite to be launched is to actually uh, learn how to orient the satellite using these torque coils. So I'm going to go over the physics super briefly. Um, a torque coil is just a wrap of wire. That's about it. You put a current through it, and that generates a magnetic field. So from that magnetic field and the currents in the wire, if you apply a magnetic field across a torque coil, you can actually orient. You apply a force. You twist the torque coil, and that's a torque. It's going to be applied. And uh, the magnetic field that's going to be applied to this torque coil while it's in space is the Earth's magnetic field. So it's extremely weak. 
So uh, the measure of the strength of this torque coil is actually going to be that mu on the left there, mu equals NIA. Um, that is the magnetic dipole moment of the torque coil. So um, that is, I'm going to mention multiple times, that basically just means the strength of torquing. It's one of the two factors, the mu. On the bottom right equation, you can see that the torquing is proportional to um, the magnetic dipole moment and the strength of the applied magnetic field. And it's a cross product, it's a vector, so the actual uh, direction of all these things is also very important. So, uh, progress so far. First thing I did was to theoretically and empirically measure the magnetic dipole moment of the um, T logo cube satellite. That's the old one. And also extrapolate and try to figure out theoretical values for the, uh, the new TRL-6 or spin cube satellite that we'll be launching soon. So another aspect of this project was modeling the orbit of the satellite and making sure that we could actually see what we expected the torquing effects to be by modeling the torque coil and the spinning in space, which I'll show a little bit later on. So we had to design a new torque coil, new CubeSats, much smaller than the old one. Um, and we also use a discrete Fourier transform, which I'll discuss, that actually allows us to figure out what the spin rate of the satellite is. And finally, we designed a PC board for the, um, the, the flight board that's going to control the torque coils, turn them on and off. So, uh, this is the magnetic dipole moment that I was mentioning. That's uh, it's important for the strength of the torque coil. It's what it is. Um, so, the theoretical de determination is fairly simple. It's just based on the number of turns, the current, and the area of the torque coil. So that was, you get about 33.9 milliamps meters squared, and that's it's extremely weak. So uh, on the bottom right is the experimental setup of a torsional pendulum. For those of you that aren't familiar, I wanted to have a demonstration, but I don't have one, so I made this. So it's hanging by two wires, <laughs> and then you have your satellite, or support cyber stuff. Um, and there's, it's going to oscillate in time. Oh no, it's broken. Don't worry. There you go. Okay. It didn't work as well. Tassel fell off for sure. That's fine. Anyway, um, sorry. <laughs> so um, when you have the measurement of the magnetic dipole moment, I used uh, Lagrangian mechanics, which thanks Dr. Jones was able to do that. I uh, used equations of motion and then solved for the magnetic dipole moment. And within this system, you get that equation there where I is the current. T squared is the period of that oscillation. Uh, B is going to be uh, the strength of the applied magnetic field, and K is the torsional constant, the strength of turning. It's a, it's not, it's not. But anyway, uh, actually measuring it, you're able to see that the period speeds up quite drastically with uh, increasing B field. So it's it was kind of interesting because it's like I said, it's all very weak the magnetic fields that are induced in a torque well. So being able uh, able to actually see a visible change was kind of exciting during the research process. Um, unfortunately, the theoretical values and these values were off by about 30%. It was mostly because the setup, the magnets, not uniform over the entire torque coil. But, um, but uh, I didn't actually go back and account for that. That's one of the things that we do. So another part of this is, like I said, the simulator is very important. We need the simulator to actually judge if our uh, commands are going to properly orient the satellite in space. So one part of the simulator is actually simulating the motion of uh, the free motion, torque-free motion in space, which is actually extremely complex. So here I have a CubeSat. On the right there, the x-axis is in blue and the z-axis is in black. So the z-axis is going to have the high moment of inertia, which actually is important because that means it's going to be the axis that's uh, doing precession. I'll show, I'll show. Oh, there's a video. So you're just imagining the x-axis is spinning around the z-axis rapidly while the z-axis is slowly precessing in space. And this is as simple as the motion gets in space. 
So, and then of course we're gonna, this is torque free motion, we're gonna be torquing the system. So the simulation process was very difficult to program. Uh, I made headway, but uh, I have not finished it as of yet. So uh, that little green line that I have there is the um, angular momentum vector, and that's actually what a torque is, is the change in the angular momentum vector with time. That's, a torque, but that's kind of physics people. <laughs> so uh, another part of the simulation was actually plotting that angular momentum vector as it moves in space. Because if you plot z, it's just kind of rotating and it's not clear where it's actually pointing. So the angular momentum vector is really useful for determining the pointing of the satellite. So I simulated that on here. Uh, it's not going to show up with this light, but you can see that the angular momentum vector kind of moves a little bit over time as a torque is being applied to the system. <coughs> okay. So another aspect of this project Um, I designed some 3D printed coils to actually put into the satellite, and those have been 3D printed already. And that was just another, actually, it's not, it's not too related to everything else, but it's another central part of the project that has to be done by the time the satellite's launched. So this uh, was an improvement on an old program. We had a discrete Fourier transform which takes, in this case, magnetic field measurements as the satellite is spinning in space. And as you take these measurements, the satellite spins, and you'll get a sine wave coming out. So that sine wave can actually be reduced down to the frequency domain so you can figure out what the spin rate is. So it'll give you one peak on the left you can see there. So that's what our DFT used to look like, but uh, after doing a lot of coding, we've improved it by about eight times, almost an order of magnitude better, and you can see you can get a really accurate uh, frequency of the spin rate. <coughs> so in the future, um, we've actually started the flight configuration of the torque coils and decided, decided on the design of it and the positioning within the satellite to some extent. Uh, the inertial moments could be measured to make these measurements more accurate, to make the simulator more accurate. And I wanted to demonstrate torque in a lab setting. As I've mentioned, the magnetic field of the Earth is extremely weak, and the dipole moment of the torque coil, because it's so small, is fairly weak. But um, only with a larger applied field to actually see the visible effect. But uh, I was hoping to get uh, something that was actually visible. Um, but friction is too high. But in space, that's not the case. So, uh, lastly, uh, I have to actually make the flight code that's going to be responsible for the attitude control. And that's, I mean, that's the ultimate step. And then, of course, we launch it and we see if it all works. And that's, that's the best part. And that's, that's it. I just wanted to acknowledge the physics department. Garrett, mentor, is very helpful. Um, Definitely could not have made as much progress without him. Uh, Lynn and uh, just several other members, collaborator Bob Twiggs and past students and other professors who have helped along the way. So thank you very much. <laughs>